week our study of First Corinthians, and we started it continuing the way that we had been studying the other books when we had the Zoom class going and we were not assembling on Wednesday evening. And we want to continue to do that. I made a comment, I think, in the Zoom class, I may have said it last week, too, that there's no way that we're going to be able to read every word and cover the material that we're talking about, but we can lay out the outline and the main points and the background and the central themes and so forth of the book because each one of us should be reading each word of whatever book we're studying. Well, that's the only way you actually can engage in a proper study of it. Hopefully what we're doing here will be helpful to you when you do that. We had uh, ended last week's lesson by trying to point out the background of the city of Corinth and Achaia. It's about 50 miles from Athens, very rich city in its day, a very lascivious, uh, immoral city, even more so than some of the other places in the whole of the Roman Empire. And it helps us to understand a little better how that these brethren in the city at Corinth, at least what they came out of. Now, Jews being there and faithful in the law of Moses, when they obeyed the gospel, much of this immorality wasn't among them. But as far as the Gentiles are concerned, unless they'd been proselytes, then they were having to get over all of that. Sometimes I think today that we fail to understand just how powerful the gospel is. Also, we need to remind ourselves there was a time when the gospel message and what we read in our New Testaments, and we used to say it this way, was brand spanking new. <laughs> Nobody had ever heard of such a message as is taught in the New Testament. It's hard maybe for us to realize what it was to be in a pagan world, a pagan culture, a pagan society for all those hundreds and hundreds of years. But nevertheless, there, there wasn't any denominational churches around. There wasn't anything like that. There was nothing but a uh, immoral culture and immorality was all wrapped up in the worship of the idols. And... Uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, we can see the kind of people some of these folks that made up the church at Corinth were when the gospel of Christ was preached to them. Paul points out 1 Corinthians 6 in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, not homosexuals, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, not covered just about any kind of immorality, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then look at verse 11. And such were, were, past tense, such were some, of you. Well, what made the difference? Well, their belief and obedience to the gospel. Notice, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Same gospel did that for them that did it to those Jews who were called devout in Acts chapter 2, the day the church started in Jerusalem on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. So we need to realize how powerful the gospel is. Remember in the book of Romans, we notice Paul saying in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew also and to the Greek. So as we look round about us and our society, you might remember some of the things I said this past, in this past Lord's Day morning sermon about the state of America, that's nothing new to you, you know that. But are we going to look at that as something that's a 
depressing thing or are we going to look at it as a challenge? I want you to think of what Jesus said and I want you to think about the time he said it. He said the fields are white under the harvest. And I want you to think about that because that was before the church was established and that was dealing with the Jews primarily, but it had to do and was said in the light of the fact the church would be established and that the commission was to the church to carry the gospel to every creature and thus it would have to do with carrying the gospel to people like those in Corinth. And you see that what it did for some of those folks, they actually believed it. We should not in our minds allow ourselves to think well, here's a group of people. Now, this one, this one right here, that one looks like he's worthy to hear the gospel. I don't know about these other folks, but that one. You don't see that in the book of Acts. In the book of conversions, look at the kind of people that were converted. And some of them we would not, looking at things as a mere human, think that they were really interested in studying the Bible at all, the way we say it today. So we need to always keep in mind these people, I don't know how many times I can say it, but I'll keep saying it, they already heard the gospel and they believed and obeyed the same gospel you did, or we believed and obeyed the same gospel they did. And they were Christians, our brothers and sisters in Christ, just like any other member of the church. Yet you can see their need to grow and to develop and to repent of sins, and yet they were still members of the church. So if uh, we keep that in mind, we want to look a little more closely at the establishment of the church in uh, Corinth. You'll remember that it was started when Paul, who was assisted by Priscilla and Aquila and Timothy and Silas, came there in Acts, the accounts found in Acts 18. Verses 1 through 11, Acts 18, 1 through 11. And following Paul, we have Apollos working there, Acts 18, 24 through 28. He built upon the foundation, you might say, that Paul laid. And then uh, we learn, too, that the time of its establishment was around 50 or 51 A.D., when Paul was on his second preaching tour. We see, too, that uh, Paul supported himself, and we talked a little bit about his training as a tradesman, as a, a tent maker, but he supported himself by making tents, and that was the same trade that Priscilla and Aquila uh, had Acts chapter 18, 1 through 3, and, and they were Jews who became Christians. They had been expelled from the city of Rome by Emperor Claudius when he drove all the Jews out of Rome, and that's where they came to. And They had become Christians, and Paul got with them, and they worked together in getting the church started there in the city of, of Corinth. I think sometimes I try to imagine this when I drive up and down streets, like anywhere around here. And I try to imagine now if you were walking down a street in Corinth, or any other city for that matter, but we're talking about Corinth, so we'll use it for an example. And you see all of these different uh, the church buildings up and down here. Well, if you walk down the streets at that time, especially certain areas, then you would see all these different idolatrous temples and they were a people who had all kinds we see that even from the ruins today all kinds of statues one of the things that this has nothing to do except helping us understand the situation better but we see all of that over there today just as white white marble even the ruins are all white it wasn't that way in Paul's day it hadn't been that way hundreds of years before. The Greeks and the Romans painted all that. All those statues. And some of them that appear even naked today would have had clothes painted on them. A lot of them uh, hung robes on them. The appropriate way they wore their clothes. But they would have had eyes painted. They would have had 
for their hair and tone, flesh tone. All that would have been that way. Even when you come down far past that time and you see these cathedrals built back in the thousands in Europe, I say in the thousands, I mean the year 1000, and we see them today as gray and basically that. They, when they were built, were painted like that too. They were like that whole area was like a Christmas tree as far as the way all these vibrant colors were everywhere. Now, they didn't have neon lights. <laughs> they had nothing like that. But people have always loved bright colors. I don't know why we think the ancients didn't. And even pagans, even more so. And uh, I even remember somebody by the name of Jacob who had his favorite son, a coat made of many colors. So I, we should not remove ourselves from them by saying, well, they just didn't see things as we did. So you take all that and put it in a pagan situation, immorality, and you're talking about the red light district. Now, it was everywhere you looked because it was a part of their fabric. And their gods all figured in with that stuff. And it was all a part of it. So here comes somebody like Paul like Timothy, like Silas. And they come into this place. And you see the kind of people they met. And you see many of them that heard that gospel that you heard, that I heard, and they obeyed it. And in trying to get them out of certain sins once they became Christians, he reminds them of the mess they came out of when they became Christians. And that's what he does, 1 Corinthians 6. So when you went anywhere in the first century... That's what you're going to come across to one extent or the other. Now, if you're able to study with Jews, then, and they're faithful to what they believe as Jews, and they won't be like this. But they had been so corrupted because they had come up with all kinds of traditions, and that's what got Jesus crucified by them, because they were binding their traditions as if it was the Word of God. And Jesus said, How be it you do worship me vainly? teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. So um, we need to understand that Paul thought, while well, I have a right, and he'll say that to them, to take money from you to support me while I preach and teach you the truth and nurture you, I didn't do that. That's, a, that's where you can have something that's authorized. Now listen here, this is an important point. We must have everything we do for the Lord authorized by the New Testament. But not all authorized matters are obligatory matters. Paul was authorized to take funds from the brethren to support himself to teach the truth. But it was not obligatory that he had to do that in order to go to heaven. It was something he could choose to do. Or not. Remember Paul said, all things are lawful unto me. You know the rest of it. But all things are not expedient. So there can be a lot of things authorized, but as far as you're living the Christian life, it's best that you don't do them. Or it's best that you do do them. And you can see him deal with that in the book of Corinthians. He does that under the, as he calls it, the present distress regarding getting married. If you're a man, you're not married, stay that way. If you're a woman, you're not married, stay that way. But if you do marry, you haven't sinned. Now, do you see how there is authorization? But as he calls it under the present distress, it's probably better that you don't. So in rightly dividing the word of truth, one of the principles of interpretation is to realize that about authority. That you must have Bible authority for what you do, but not all Bible authority obligates you to do something. It is authorized for a man to marry a woman, a woman to marry a man. All other things being scripturally equal, but it's not obligatory. That is, 
you can go to heaven as a bachelor. <laughs> All the things being scripturally equal. So we must understand the right and divine the word of truth that while we may say, well, that's not a wise thing for them to do, well, it may not be wise for them to marry in that present distress. That doesn't mean it's a sin. Because Paul even said that if you go ahead and marry, you'll have problems in the flesh. Why? Because you take on two new roles. You take on obligations once you're married that you didn't have when you were single. And thus, that can cause problems, not insurmountable in the sense of remaining faithful, but problems. So I want you to keep that in your mind. I'm saying it up front as one of those points that needs to be driven home regarding our own study of the Scriptures and ascertaining our Lord's authority for what we believe and what we practice, which we, we must do. So Paul had to iron some of that out. When you go through the book, you will see him trying to get some of that straightened out in their thinking. They are new. He tells them in the beginning that they're carnal. They're still carnal. Well, they're members of the church. He called them the church of God and sanctified. He said, you're carnal. Well, what do you mean by that? You're out here committing fornication right and left and everything? Else? No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Though they had a problem with that, didn't they? Well, what does it mean? You haven't used your time or had the time to analyze and think through things in the light what does the Lord say about this and you just don't know do you remember a time in your life as a new Christian to when you weren't sure about certain things you knew there was something here but you said I don't quite understand that let's see do we have anything like that in the Bible yeah, Philip went running up at the direction of the Lord to a chariot, and a man was reading the Scriptures, and he was a devout man. He had come a long, long way, and he was a governmental authority in charge of Queen Candace's treasury, and yet he had traveled all that long way from Ethiopia to worship under the law, and Philip has the audacity to run up to him while he's studying from Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? Now, you know, if that had been one of us, I don't think we would have abruptly... <laughs> Approached him that way, but that's not the way the Bible works sometimes, does it, as far as the way God has us do something. Philip just got right down to brass tacks. Do you understand what you're reading in that book? And you know what he learned immediately? The man was honest. Honest as he could be. How can I, except some man should guide me? I need a teacher. You ever been in that position? Well, I think we all have. Uh, how many have ever read a commentary? How many of you have ever asked a preacher, what, what does this mean? How many have asked somebody as a Bible school teacher, what, what, what does this mean? Well, we all need that. So in our study on our own, in the reading of the Scriptures, then we must understand that. Well, these people had heard the same gospel that we heard. They had obeyed it, but yet they were having problems living the Christian life. Now, Paul had to find out, are you teachable? Are you going to bow your neck right here with these problems that I'm going to have to deal with in this letter? And Paul t takes the same direct approach that Philip did to the Ethiopian eunuch when Philip was sent to convert that man. He doesn't mince any words. He tells them how much he loves them. He tells them what they are, and they need to be reminded of that. And then he just gets right down to the brass tacks and tells them exactly where his message came from or the information he had came from about the things that he's going to write to them throughout the book. And he deals with it directly. Where does this saying come from? I, I don't know where it started. It had to be way back there. Quit beating around the bush. And when I say that, what do you understand me to mean if you were talking to me or if I were talking to you let's turn it around that way and I was wanting to say something to me to you and, and I kept talking and you knew there was something I was trying to say but I, I was talking all around it and on top of it and under it and all that stuff and you said to me David quit beating around the bush just say it what do you think I'm supposed to understand by your comment to me <laughs> go ahead and say it we have another one like that too. Just spit it out. It, it's uh, 
it's something about us that when you really need to say something to somebody that you think may really ruffle their feathers or hurt their feelings, but you know they need to hear about it. They must know about it. It's for their own good. And you love them or you wouldn't be there anyway. Sometimes it's best to get down to the brass tacks. Do you understand what you're reading, James? Well, you didn't have to be so abrupt about it. Well, isn't that what we're all about? Why do you have Bible classes? I don't know. Why do we have Bible classes? What are you doing in those Bible classes? Well, the very fact you're having, you're admitting your ignorance. Well, I can't afford to do that. So we could learn a little bit from this. How do you think, then, that they must have approached those people in the city of Corinth in view of the caliber of people they were. Somebody had to come down to the point to where they had to deal with not things in general and vague things, but fornication. They had to deal with idolatry, the sin of it, that you're going to die in your sin. You can't do that and be acceptable to God. And on with being adulterous and homosexuals and abuse themselves, mankind, thieves and covetous and drunkards and revilers and extortioners. They had to come to grips with the fact that these things we've done for years and thought nothing about it is sending us straight to hell. And if we become Christians, that's got to be put away from us. Well, there's no way the gospel is going to be preached outside of Judaism and not deal with idolatry and all of its attendant evils. And they were very immoral people. My point is, somebody had to get right down to, that's a bottle of water. <laughs> and I can't say it's not. It's not a bottle of air. It, if you're going to get, it's, it's a plastic bottle of water if you're going to get more plain, period. So they had to be that plain about it and Paul was in writing them and saying you know where you were when the gospel got there you know what you were believing and doing now he does that because if you look at the chapter just before that they were doing something in the way of fornication that wasn't even named among these terrible immoral Corinthians who were still in the world man had his father's wife so the church was composed of both Jews and Gentiles I don't know if there were very many wealthy people involved. I think if you look at chapter 1 and verses 26 through 31, uh, I, I imagine, as it is the case in a lot of times today, these people from pretty humble ranks of society, because Paul reminded them, for you see your calling, verse 26, chapter 1, brethren, that... Not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world, and found the wise, and God's chosen the weak things of the world, and found the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. That tends to tell me uh, there wasn't that many people among the church that was all caught up and in love with this present world as far as secularism is concerned and, and wealth, uh, all this kind of thing. Doesn't mean there wasn't some people that didn't have good livings, uh, didn't have more than a lot of other folks. Well, that's true, always been true of the church, always been true of God's people in Mosaical Age and Patriarchal Age. But there's a whole host of folks who are just not open at all to the truth. Now, we don't know who that is sometimes until we try them on for size and find out. But anyway, this is the kind of people that heard the gospel people who were willing to be taught, 
people that you would call humble, regardless of their economic station or educational station in life, also shows you that people who will not believe in revelation, as we have the Bible being a revelation from God, are people who see things only through the eyes of flesh. We've talked about it many times who have only and recognized only empirical knowledge, what they can see and smell and taste and so forth. Those people many times just think this is foolishness. Isn't that what Paul said? Talk about such as that. They, they think it's ridiculous to think of a God, of sin. And so you decide there is no God, thus when you're dead you just cease to be. But anyway, there are those few, and we don't know who those few are, and I say few in comparison to the great number of people in the world or the great number of people in our nation or the great number of people right around us who will listen, but we know who they are. But we have an obligation, and they did too, so they worked with those people, and the gospel was powerful to convert them. Didn't mean the work was over, did it? Because look how they've gotten themselves into some serious problems as far as sin is concerned once they became Christians. But Paul said, are you teachable? I'm going to find out. And I want to try, first of all, through this, this letter to see if you'll be persuaded by me as an apostle of Christ and the one who started the church there to come out of your sins. Because he'll say later on, you want me to come to you with a rod or in love, in the spirit of meekness. Do you want me to exercise my apostolic corrective powers of authority? Are you going to be reasoned with like you ought to be? After all, there was a time when they were reasoned with by the gospel. They heard it, they believed, they obeyed it. So keep that in mind. They, there were, as there always has been, uh, marked social and economic differences between them as there are between us. And if you look, and I won't read all of this, but you can mark it, chapter 7, verses 20 through 24 tends to bring that out. Uh, even slaves, chapter 11, 21 through 34. I will read this part in, in chapter 7. Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. With their call being a servant, which means a slave, care not for it. If thou mayest be free, use it rather. In other words, uh, if you're a slave, when you hear and obey the gospel, then you live that way. If you get free, use it to your advantage. One of the things that we have to learn in being a Christian is that whatever stage we're in, some things we can control, some things we cannot. But wherever you are, as long as that condition is not within itself contrary to God's law, then you use it expeditiously for the Lord. Sometimes just take a look at Paul's life. And whatever he found him, wherever he found himself, whatever conditions he found himself, he used it for the spreading of the gospel, the defense of the faith, to influence people for the Lord. Now everybody doesn't have the same sphere of influence, but we all have a sphere of influence. Some of these people, as we've seen, have been steeped for a long time in pagan immorality. We just read that in chapter 6, 9 through 11, before their conversion, but yet the gospel converted them. And as Greeks, they certainly prided themselves in a higher education of the day and intellectualism and uh, oratorical ability, chapter 1, 17, all the way through chapter 2, 5. That's that's what you still study today. You had what men valued as very important. And they looked at it from that standpoint. And being Greeks, they were given then to a very contentious <laughs> spirit because they fussed at one another constantly. Chapter 111 through 13, I think, shows you that. Uh, let's just read that for a moment. Chapter 111 through 13. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. All I can say to that is, after 2,000 years, there seems to be a whole lot of Greeks in the church. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, if you look in verse 10, you'll see right there that what we have is the first chapter, and he gets down to the 10th verse, thinking about coming right to the point and what you're trying to get over. Well, boy, he gets right down to it. And he tells right where his information came from, and he says, what you're doing is just wrong. And he develops that. We also, in looking into this letter about the church in Corinth, we see a clash that occurs when um, New Testament teaching on godly living, we would call it in the area of, of morality and ethics, collide with that immoral world and the various standards that governed it. And you're brought to a point to say, I've got to make a decision. You can't embrace both. When I was working among the Vietnamese um, years and years ago now, over closer to 50 years, I used to say 40, now it's closer to 50. <laughs> uh, I had one come up to me. I taught a Bible class every day in a uh, chapel area there on the base Fort Chaffee. Monday through Friday, and then had worship service on Sunday for from May till I don't know, I guess it was August. I don't remember right now. And I remember at one time, one fellow came up, one woman, a woman came up to me and wanted to know if she could be a Buddhist and a Christian at the same time. <laughs> and and the reason for that was you have to understand their culture. You just sort of, you know, we've been thrown into this situation. We want to be accepted. Everything over here is Christian, quote, quote. But I know what I'm really persuaded, and I know where my ancestors come from and what we've always believed, so can I do both? And, of course, there's your opportunity. And we begin to, to study some. Uh, you're going to have those situations happen, but sometimes you have to make them happen. Now, the situation there was because people were coming to wherever we were holding Bible classes because they'd been completely cast out of their country, period. Fort Chaffee out of Fort Smith was one of three places the Vietnamese came into once they left. And some of you may remember seeing the pictures on television how they got out of Saigon and now Ho Chi Minh City. And under what terrible circumstances it was, they just simply got out, as we would say, by the skin of their teeth. They brought anything out much besides themselves. They had some way they were trying to bring money out. That's another story, but it's interesting when the banks set up trailers out there to be bankers to, to hear some of the stories of, of the way these Vietnamese brought their money out and what they converted it to to try to get it out. But that has nothing to do with us. But it shows you that when things get turned upside down and your routine way of doing things and your whole culture doesn't exist anymore, uh, then you start thinking. And you, you don't have anything to think with like we would coming from our belief in God and Christ and the Bible. They don't have that. Now, Roman Catholicism was quite strong. And I guess still is in, in Vietnam because it was known as French Indochina. It was a colony of France till the uh, Viet Minh kicked them out after the 1954 at the Battle of Dien Bien Phu and then immediately started on what developed into the war in South Vietnam in the 60s. But we have never lived in a situation where we have had our whole culture and society turned upside down virtually overnight. And everything we knew was taken away from us. So this lady asked that question of me, and it gave me an opportunity to study with her. And there was a lot of that kind of thing. That's just one example. I never remember seeing it again after we had our visit that day. And that's part of spreading the gospel. You don't know. We need to remember that early Christians uh, also had no public church buildings like we've become accustomed to at least as, as we use. Um, you might not know this, but buildings, as we would call them church buildings, came about near the middle or the th of the third century, which would be roughly 250, AD 250. Until then, because of the uh, 
persecution, first by the Jews, then by the empire, then by the government really itself at various times, uh, they would meet wherever they could, private homes, various halls, schools, wherever they could have a place to assemble. But one thing they were determined to do is on the first day of the week assemble and do in that assembly what God commanded them to do. That was authorized and obligatory, and this they did. So we would do well to realize that we can still be just as faithful to God as he requires in the New Testament, whether we can continue on as we have it now. And so those people, when the church was at Corinth in these days, there was no particular church-owned church building. We know the names of several of the early members of the church there. We have to go back to Acts where we find Paul coming there and, and things being uh, changed by the gospel, people being converted. You'll remember Crispus who was the ruler of the Jewish synagogue, Acts 18.8. You have, uh, well, we already have mentioned Chloe. Some of his information or the information about the state of the church at Corinth came from some of the household of Chloe. And by the way, Paul did not mind mentioning the person that gave him the information. I want to pause here and say this about that. Over the years as a preacher, I do not know how many times people have come in different congregations and told what purported to be factual things in people's lives, but they would not tell. In other words, they would not document it. They wouldn't footnote it. They wouldn't tell where it came from. Now here is uh, the truth from a letter written by an apostle of Christ who's inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it's there. And what do you learn from that? If I'm going to say Brett is out here teaching thus and so, well, you know, I think, well, have you talked to him about it? Or who told you that? And a whole lot of times, there is no, it has been reported to me by them which are of the household of glory. <laughs> it's not done. And so we find that we violate the pattern set right here. But it's also true that somebody reported that such and such was going on. And Paul built this whole letter on the report he got from those of the household of glory. You ever have people tell you, you weren't there to witness that. How can you know one way or the other? Was Paul there to witness all these things going on in the church at Corinth? Personally witness them? No. He wasn't at all. But he did tell them where he got his information. So there's a lot in these letters that sometimes we don't see as authoritative, but they are. They're teaching us how to conduct ourselves under similar circumstances 2,000 years removed from that society and culture and situation. So we know of Gaius and we know of Stephanus, 1 Corinthians 1, 11 through 16. Those are some of the names. And they were a part of this. Now, let's leave that about the church being established in the I will spend about just a few minutes here. The book itself, we've already noticed, was written by the Apostle Paul. We think it was written sometime in the winter of 54 up through 57, about the best we can do. He was in Ephesus. He had received this information when he wrote it, chapter 16, in verse number 8. And it's simply put, it's obvious to anybody, it's named for those to whom it was written. Um, we'll mention some of the purposes. we we'll have to stop on these. He wanted to deal with factions and disorders in the church. Chapter 1, verse 11, 3, and verse 3. Now, do you think that you're going to obey the gospel and be a faithful Christian in view of what a congregation of God's people is and what that congregation is to do organized according to the New Testament under the headship of Christ, and you not have to deal with some of these things from some time or another. I wish that every member of the church was as close to God as it's possible for human being to be. 
But that's not real, is it? That's not the way Satan's going to have it. He's going to sift, as Jesus said to Peter, Satan is desired to sift you as wheat. Now, if that was Satan's desire concerning Peter, what do you think his desire is concerning you and me? He wanted to answer some questions they had put to him. And the only way we know what those questions are, and that begins in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, is because of the answers. We formulate the questions out of the answers that he gives because he didn't say, now you've asked me some questions, we'll deal with them in order. Question number one, blah, 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 let me answer it. He doesn't do that. He wanted to correct then the serious moral and social problems that were in the congregation. That is introduced in chapter 5, 1 through 13. And above all, as the whole New Testament does, and as every Christian, if they're faithful, do, is exalt Jesus as Christ, the Lord of glory, in their hearts and in the actions of their lives, chapter 1 and verse 9. And then this will be the last point tonight, which is one that's always on our minds. He wanted to remind them that God is faithful but they had to be concerned about whether they were faithful to him. Chapter 1, verse 9. And notice that's right in the beginning. Verse 9, God is faithful. By whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus our Lord. But then notice immediately verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. I'll close on that with this remark. At the first barely rearing of the head of division in the church, now these people were saying they weren't Christians. They were saying they're Christians, but they were divided among themselves. Denominationalism is struck a death blow in verse 10. If you didn't have anything else about unity in the Bible, Denominationalism does, is not of the same mind and is not of the same judgment. It justifies being acceptable to God by being of a different mind and having different judgments. And this is condemned right here. Well, we'll stop here and look at some interesting facts, the Lord willing. Maybe we should say more interesting facts uh, in our lesson. We'll get together next week. God permitting, we are glad you came. That's all. Remember, one other than prayer, and just in case somebody has any questions, do you have any? Since no one indicates any questions, sort of like the Zoom meeting, <laughs> we'll call her quits. So we're dismissed.